Is there anything about the Christian worldview that you think is at least challenged by these scientific developments? Evolution, whatever it does, um, is not an argument against the involvement of a creator. I mean, like, do, do you think that there is reason to doubt that I share a common ancestor with a chimpanzee? Atheist Alex O'Connor just put evolution on the table and asked John Lennox to prove to him why he shouldn't believe in it. And the answer he got, man, was just absolutely brilliant. You need to hear this, man. Let's go. I think some of these archetypal scientific revolutions, the Copernican revolution, the revolution of biology with natural selection and Charles Darwin, um, even things like the revolutions in physics with uh, with quantum mechanics. Yeah. Do you think that any of these pose any challenges to, say, the Christian worldview? Is there anything about the Christian worldview that you think is at least challenged by these scientific developments? Well, we need to take them separately. Sure. Uh, and certainly, as uh, one person has said, at least one, that Darwinism proved to be an engine of atheism. Yes. Well, I think this is the, the most important example here is and probably evolution. It is. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Quantum mechanics, actually, to take your other example, for some people, opened up yeah. the possibility of freedom and all the business of giving, to put it this way, which I don't really like, space for God, so to speak, yeah. and not uh, confining the universe to be a deterministic entity. I think that it is a very interesting case in point that a lot of people jumped on the Darwinist bandwagon until relatively recently. It was often used as a reason to get rid of God in some way or other. My mm -hmm. thinking of it is, well, it's quite complicated actually. First of all, the idea that there is a creator God is not going to be refuted by a biological theorem. I'm not even convinced they're in the same kind of category. Mm -hmm. In other words, evolution, whatever it does, and I'm saying that quite deliberately, is not an argument against the involvement of a creator. Yes, this is so important. Evolution, even if it's true, doesn't eliminate God. It's like saying we understand how a car engine works, so there is no car manufacturer. So understanding the mechanism here doesn't get rid of the designer. So Lennox is separating the science from the worldview interpretation. I spoke to one very well-known biologist who is a strong believer in evolution and is a Christian. And I said to him, in the end, if I'm pushed to it, God can do it any way he liked. So that if it happens to be that way, that is not an argument against the existence of God any more than the existence of an automatic self-winding watch, which uses random motions of your arm to wind itself up, is an argument against the existence of an intelligent watchmaker. Mm -hmm. That calling in of randomness doesn't get rid of God at all. Mm -hmm. But of course, if you're going to use evolution as an argument against God, first of all, you've got to know that evolution is true and you've got to define what it does. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. And here, you run into very many more difficulties now than you would have done 20 years ago. Right. And I just make two points, and they're quite important points. And that is we need to distinguish between evolution and the origin of life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, Richard Dawkins, as you know, who's a brilliant writer, I must say, um, I remember reading his book, The Blind Watchmaker. Yes. And what arrested me uh, in reading it, and I can almost quote it verbatim, so that's a compliment to Richard, um, <laughs> that evolution, the blind automatic mechanism that, Dar that Darwin discovered, is the explanation for the existence and the development of all of life. He said that? Yes, it's in the book. Yeah. And it took a very long time for him to realize that the first part of that statement is false. Yes. For a very simple reason, because evolution, again, whatever it does or doesn't do, depends on the existence of life yes. to do anything. So it cannot be the explanation for life. Lennox just exposed the biggest shell game in science education because they teach evolution as if it explains everything, but it can't even explain how life started in the first place. You need life before evolution can do anything. That's like saying natural selection created the first cell. It makes no sense. 
Now, of course, people these days get round that by talking about chemical evolution and so on. That's nothing to do with mutation and natural selection, and we could go into that. But as a mathematician, it's the former interests me more. That is the origin of life itself, because it's almost equivalent, though not quite, to the origin of information. I see there a huge right. problem. But staying with now the second part of Dawkins' assertion, it explains all the development of life. Now, here's where I think one has to be nuanced and to be fair, because Darwin was brilliant. He observed things that people had not observed. He observed changes. For example, the famous study of the finch beaks mm -hmm. in um, the Galapagos Islands. And I have a 1,000 page book at home, a famous book of that, and I've read most of it. And that was hailed as evidence. But of what? It certainly was evidence of cyclic change. What not so many people were aware of is that once the drought conditions uh, disappeared, the proportion of long beaks to short beaks actually moved back to what it was before. But nevertheless, he could see that something was happening that filled niches and enabled existing creatures to adapt to new niches. Now, that seems to me to be uncontroversial because we can observe it. But when it goes beyond that to the creation, if I must use that word, of new life forms or all this kind of thing. I think that's a very different matter. Now, I'm very aware that I'm not a biologist. Hmm. And secondly, I believe in Richard Feynman's wonderful dictum. He says, the scientist outside his own field is as dumb as anybody else. <laughs> and I've got to remember that. But I have tried to read my biology, especially in recent, in recent years. And I, I comfort myself that everybody from Darwin to Dawkins wrote for the intelligent public. They expect us to understand what mm. they write. And I have a huge difficulty with that kind of what we may call macroevolution. But much more interestingly is what has happened in the last few years with so-called systems biology, where the Darwinian mechanism, well, natural selection was his, uh, mutation was later. But if we put both together and we have the neo-Darwinian hypothesis, that has been called into very deep question as being totally inadequate. Mm -hmm. Here in Oxford, Dennis Noble, one of the most fascinating characters, fellow of the Royal Society, and he's debated Richard on a number of, of occasions. And his argument is really in the end that natural selection, that neo-Darwinian thesis, doesn't need to be modified. It needs to be replaced because it's completely inadequate. Because now, and here I'm just saying what I read, the uh, problem is, and it's a chicken-the-egg problem, that uh, most simply perhaps can be realized, here is DNA. You can't get DNA without a cell. You can't get a living cell mm. without DNA. So uh, how does that work? And what seems to me to be happening, and I've actually written quite a lot about this in, my, in a recent book, Cosmic Chemistry, Do God and Science Mix, that there appears to be a top-down causation, and it leads to a huge problem because it was enough level of complexity to discover that the DNA molecule was not simply complex, it was linguistically complex. Mm -hmm. That is, it gave us a 3.4 billion letter long word in oh. uh, a chemical alphabet. And DNA isn't just complicated, it's a language. Like, did you just hear what he said? 3.4 billion letter instructions in every cell. And here's the thing, all those letters, they have to be in the right order or nothing works. Even Richard Dawkins admits that random processes, they can't curate this. So. Where did the information come from? And all those letters had to be in the right order. That is a stupendous level of complexity, okay. which is no chance of being generated by random processes. And Richard Dawkins agrees with that. He, right. he brings in uh, something that, uh, that natural selection actually has a different kind of operation, but we're not going to that at the moment. But the point is now, with the more recent discoveries of the nature of the living cell and all the chemical factories in it, there are levels upon levels of complexity beyond the genome. And that just beggars into uh, unbelief, mm. the possibility that any known mechanism can produce that without the input of intelligence. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm in your boat, but 
<laughs> but at an even sort of lower level below the deck in that it's not just so much outside of my scientific expertise, biology, but I, I'm, I'm not even a scientist. And so I'm also aware of my limitations in being able to engage with this material. Um, I do understand that on, on the popular level, I think like Stephen Meyer has been uh, talking about this kind of thing quite publicly. And I understand that a lot of people are beginning to question at least Darwinian evolution. But to understand you correctly, would that entail doubting, for example, that, say, myself and a chimpanzee share a common ancestor? Because I understand that the, the mechanism of, of getting DNA off the ground and this kind of thing is this unimaginable mystery. But once we've sort of granted that, intelligently produced or not, does that suspicion go to that depth of evolution? I mean, like, do, do you think that there is reason to doubt that I share a common ancestor with a chimpanzee? Well, it can do. Uh -huh. People are divided on that. And I, I understand the point very well. You know, from a mathematical point of view, if you take a set of things, you can often order them in a hierarchy. And uh, that's clearly true in yep. the animal kingdom. You can use uh -huh. various criteria for organizing. Them. But the, the whole question of common ancestry assumes that you've got a mechanism that drives the one to the other. Mm -hmm. And I often use, well, I sometimes use a, an argument that I think Darwin was aware of in some way. I have a vague memory that I got it from one of his letters, mm -hmm. but it's something like this. You and I are biologists and uh, there's desperate need in the world for some kind of grain that resists, let's say, floods and, uh, and so on and so forth. And we sit in the laboratory and we genetically engineer a new type of wheat that's very successful. A thousand years hence, people are investigating the archaeology of this and they're trying to determine what is related to what. Now, they know nothing about us or what we mm -hmm. did. And their research, if it's done on the basis of a dominant naturalism, will completely miss the fact that there was an intelligent input at one point mm -hmm. creating this new level. And that'll be due to their methodological assumption. Yes, that's, that's right. And you can't blame them in a way if, uh -huh. if that's the way they're working. Quite. So it seems to me we... Oh, this analogy, guys, is just brilliant. Future st scientists studying our genetically engineered wheat would organize it in family trees and miss the fact that we designed it. Now, the same thing here could be happening with life, you know, because we've become so committed to naturalistic explanations that, you know, we're missing the obvious design in life. You've got to be extremely careful that the ability to organize things into various hierarchies is an indicator, certainly an argument for development without input of intelligence, but right. it's not conclusive. And it seems to me, in other words, my faith in God doesn't depend on whether there's a common ancestor or not. Uh -huh. Certainly God could do it that way, but I'm not convinced that he has mm -hmm. because the analogy I gave you has got more to it than you may first realize because it's saying that at a certain point, there was an input from outside the system, yep. an intelligent input from you and me mm -hmm. as uh, the scientists involved. Now, mm -hmm. from the biblical point of view, and this has always interested me, the biblical description of creation is very minimal. It's a hundred words, I think, Genesis mm -hmm. 1 in Hebrew, something like that. But what is emphasized in that description has always fascinated me because several times over you read, and God said, and God said. Mm -hmm. So these various stages, the days of Genesis, whatever you make of them, these stages are each introduced by God speaking. Now, again, the New Testament says very little about the how of creation, mm -hmm. but it does say something. Mm. And it says something very profound to my mind, and that is, in the beginning was the, the word. word. That is, the word already was. And this is an existence statement because it then goes on to say, through the word, all, all things, things were created. came to be, is actually what the Greek says. Yes, okay. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating. So the word already was, the word never came to be. The world came to be, you and I came to be. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, there comes the huge statement which shows John's fascination by existence. And the word came to be, human or came to be flesh. Mm -hmm. God became human, which is a central Christian claim. But sticking at the creation level, my reaction to that is, this is a word-based creation. Now, do we see any evidence of that? 
I believe we do. First mm. of all, in the fact that lots of things in our universe are mathematically describable. That is, we can use the language of mathematics to describe them. Mm -hmm. And that is so amazing mm -hmm. that Indeed. really clever people like Einstein saw that there was a problem. And you remember the famous thing he said, the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it's comprehensible. Mm, yes. He could see that there was something absolutely amazing that someone thinking here could come up with equations that describe what's going on out there. So a word-based universe at that level. But then, much later than Einstein, we discovered that in biology, life is a word-based phenomenon as well, an information-bearing macromolecule, DNA. So at the heart of the two sides, physics and biology, it's word-based. And that resonates very much with me in the beginning was the word. Hmm. When the Bible says word logos, it means information. DNA is literal information. Math is information. And the universe runs on information and information always comes from minds. This is such a good argument from John Lennox. I love it. And I remember this will amuse you. Years ago, I, I was working in Cardiff and next to me, or almost next to me, was Professor Chandra Wickrama Singh. I don't know whether you've heard of him. He was an astro, is an astrophysicist and worked a great deal with Fred Hoyle. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about this one day and he, he, he'd been in America and he got into one of these so-called creation trials. And he said, it's such a pity. He said, uh, the people in America, the Christians were very nice, but they're so hopelessly naive, they believe the Bible. And I felt I had to defend my Christian brothers and sisters mm. in spite of how extreme their views might be. And I said, well, actually, I believe the Bible in the sense that I take it very seriously because, of course, it's full of metaphor and all this kind of thing. And he said, prove it to me. So I walked over to the board. I'll never forget this. He threw me a piece of chalk and I had to prove it to him. So I wrote, and God said, let there be light. Mm. So Chandra roared his head off. And he said, there you go. You're as naive as the rest of them. Do you think God is a voice box in lungs like they have? And I said, Chandra, now you're being naive. This is very simple language. But if you don't mind, let me put it in different language. So underneath this, I wrote, in the beginning was the word. And he said, what does that mean? And I went on, and all things came to be through the word. Well, I said, word, speech, information. And he stopped me at that point. He said, what did you say? I said, I said, information, you heard me. He said, are you meaning to imply that this biblical text somehow refers to the concept of information? I said, it looks like. And then he said, does Fred Hoyle know about this? Hmm. I said, I don't know. So he told him. He arranged a meeting where we had a long discussion with Fred Hoyle before he died. And I remember that so very well. So it seems to me that summing this up, sorry, it's been a bit long, the this has been one of the big things in my own understanding, that God started biology according to the Bible. Mm -hmm. he, that is, he told human beings to name the animals. And tax, mm -hmm. taxonomy yes. is the basic intellectual discipline, naming things in all disciplines. We use taxonomy. And God wasn't going to do it for them. He said, you go and do it. So God is for biology, you see. And that is a mandate to my mind, mm. that we are left to have the interest, fascination, and enjoyment of finding out a great deal about the world ourselves. But the Bible does make this steering comment mm. that says it's a word-based universe. And what I say is that science has come up for the evidence for that. And that's my big problem with the naturalistic worldview. There's no uh, believable generator of word-like information mm -hmm. that any of us know about. It always is associated in our experience, at least with the human intelligence. Well, well, there it is, guys, the knockout punch. In all of human experience, information always comes from minds, period. We've never seen random processes write software or instruction manuals, but somehow DNA just wrote itself. I mean, come on. The evidence points to intelligence, not accident. What do you guys think about this video? Let me know in the comment. And if you enjoyed this video, subscribe to Daily Pursuit of Truth and keep praying for people like John Lennox. He's an amazing guy. Absolutely love him. And I'll see you in the next one.